Okay. All right, we are going to, so just before we get started today, um, any business that we conduct uh, re regarding the vote and the, the bylaws update needs to happen by raising your hand, not by putting motions and such in the chat. So if you wanna chat with people, that's fine. Uh, it will just be chats back and forth. Any business that we're conducting will be done um, so that people are, are heard. Uh, if you want to raise your hand and be heard, um, you go to the participants button and there should be a, an option there for you to raise your hand and we will take them in the order that they come. We'll get a little bit more into the details of how that will go once we get started. Um, before we do get started though, I do want to, um, uh, I'm going to bring this up really quick and just a, a little recap of how uh, Washtenaw County did uh, in, uh, let's see here bring up some of these numbers. We had, we kind of crushed it, I guess is what I, I want to say. Um, let's see here. Sorry, I'm taking longer than I wanted to. I do want to get some of these numbers to people so that they, uh, they realized, uh, so we, we know just how well we did. Um, that's not the one I want. All right, I should have brought this up. It's been a busy morning. All right. Come on, page load. There we go. Okay. So, as everybody probably recalls, and it's etched in my brain anyway, in 2016, Donald Trump won um, Michigan by 10,704 votes. Um, after that election, those of us who were involved with um, sort of the GOT part of the operation, you know, we, we really felt like if we had done just a little bit more work, we could have. And I know it's only, it's 2.2 votes per precinct and over the whole state. But here in Washington, we, we all felt like we could have possibly made up that difference of 10,704 votes just in Washtenaw County. And so for the next four years, uh, we've been intent on building a, a GOTV operation and a, a precinct organizing operation that would do that. Um, in 2008, uh, we had the high watermark in terms of turnout in Washtenaw County with 130,578 votes, 100, almost 131,000 votes. Um, in 2016, we had 128,483 votes, um, which was higher than uh, the turnout for Barack Obama in 2012, uh, but still did not reach that, uh, that high watermark of 2008. This year, we had 157,130 votes for uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, that's an increase of 28,647 votes uh, over 2016. So we, not only did we um, exceed the 10,704, uh, we exceeded it by more than a factor of two. And that was done because we have spent the last four years building this program. and. The program that we have now is superlative. It is, it is not matched by any other county party that I'm aware of in the, count, in the, in the rest of the state. Uh, it's, it's, it's beyond what's done in a lot of other states. And it's something that we really all need to just pat each other on the back for because it was a lot of hard work, uh, but it was done uh, by a group of super talented, super passionate uh, people who you know, know how to organize other people to do uh, this hard work and, and, and a big key to it, uh, and I'll circle back to this a little later in the meeting, but a big key to this is that um, we're directing people to do things for the party that they enjoy doing. Um, if you are going to work for free uh, as hard as the people who uh, do this volunteer work are doing it, <clears throat> it's got to be something that you like, otherwise it becomes a job it becomes something you have to do rather than something that you want to do. And I just think we've done such an incredible job in over the last couple of cycles of matching up people to, you know, align their talents with the things that we need to have done for the party. And so um, I just want to, you know, give my heartfelt thanks to everybody who was involved, all of the leaders, everybody. We had almost 1,100 volunteers who showed up to uh, distribute voter guides and do the poll greeting and do door hangers and all of the other things. Um, and so it was just an amazing, um, an amazing uh, effort on, on everybody's part. And I'm just so proud to be part of this team 
uh, that, that has been built here. So anyway, I just wanted to, to, to make sure that everybody was aware that, you know, we had really, we made, we atoned for our sins of 2016 by turning out over 28,000 more votes for uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris than we did for uh, uh, Barack Obama and Joe, Joe Biden, or sorry, uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Tim Kaine in, uh, in 2016. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my favorite Congresswoman, Debbie Dingle, to uh, oh, give Chris, us a little... Yep. Call, the, call the meeting to order. Oh, uh, yes, this I'm meeting is to order. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Uh, Debbie, you are muted, but uh, if you would un unmute yourself, you have the floor. Thanks, oh, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and I, I, I want to thank all the executive committee and everybody in Washtenaw County that has not only worked hard this last week, but has worked hard since for the last two years. And this is not uh, an effort that's done by one person. It's an effort that when everybody decides that they wanna work together and they wanna make a difference, that you can. So I just wanna say thank you to everybody from the bottom of my heart and to say, we gotta keep going. And you know, we did this in the age of COVID uh, we did this in a time when people were locked in their houses, that the organized campaigns weren't during, I mean, not the organized, we were an organized campaign, but the Biden campaign, one campaign weren't doing doors. Uh, we did doors. We did the voter guide. You all did the voter guide. I just did what you told me to do. Um, but, well, it's true, Chris. Uh, but um, there were so many things that everybody in Washington did that you should be proud of those increase in numbers. And I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and what an honor it is to represent Washtenaw County. So, and I just, I, I want to say that. And I, you know, I'm also going to, now I'm going to make a few observations. I was pretty frustrated that um, the 12th district got very little attention by um, the governor, I see, uh, the governor, was loves the 12th district and came in. I wish the candidates had come here, uh, but they didn't. They, they, Bernie came after Bernie promised me he would come. Uh, he didn't. We weren't able to do any of that. None of this was normal in this election. We're used to big events where we all come together and people feel that passion and that energy. And there are thousands of us saying we've got to make a difference and making a difference and. We couldn't have those kinds of events. So the closest we got was Bernie in a parking lot with chairs 12 feet apart. And he was as nervous. I mean, he wanted to come, but he was also nervous about COVID like many others and understood the importance of leadership. And that's something we all realize as we're out and about that we got to remind people, masks make a difference, we have to lead. And it's something that we didn't have in the White House. But I, I wanna make some comments now about where we are and where we go from here. Um, I've heard, uh, I, I am not shocked that the numbers were as tight as they were. I, as some of you know, said in the last couple of weeks, I thought that the race was tightening and um, I was right. And I always told you all that I thought the Senate race was far tighter than people thought that it was. I think we're lucky in the 12th to have Washtenaw, which has got such great diversity in the University of Michigan. And, and it, 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 everybody works their tails off and we produce votes. But we're a diverse district. We have Dearborn. We have the headquarters of Ford Motor Company and the largest population of Arab Americans with a strong Jewish community in Ann Arbor. And we have the Down Rivers, which are just hard working men and women, many of them who belong to a union, they work in plants, and they're reflective of many people across the country. And I think that that keeps the 12th district more real than well, some people would now say, hey, she represents Ann Arbor. What's Ann Arbor is as real as any other place. But we have to, but I think the 12th district keeps its feet on the ground and thinks about issues very reflectively and very pensively and tries to be at the forefront of change as well. A lot of people right now are stunned 
at the number of votes that Donald Trump got. And I've heard people, and yes, people from the 12th district be very judgmental about how people could vote for Trump. And I've heard some words that I, I get, but I also think we gotta be really careful to not be judgmental. I think the Democratic Party has got a, and I think the Republican Party, the Republican Party's got so many problems. It's got a woman's problem. I, I believe that women were part of what elected Joe Biden. Um, and, and, and I mean black women and white women. We have to be so careful these days to make sure um, that we're a, a phrase we mean to include. Not everybody knows that you mean to include everybody. Um, it, Detroit, um, I, I need to, I need numbers and we're still waiting on numbers. I've heard Detroit's vote was up. I've heard Detroit's vote was a thousand down. I don't know what Detroit's numbers were, but Oakland County's vote clearly increased with women. Uh, women clearly turned out in Washington. And I will not forget right after Donald Trump's I was about to say impeachment, but it was actually his inaugural. Inaugural. When I flew home and I had done the Million Women's March in Washington and met with the Michigan women and, um, and had raced back here. Uh, and there were 20,000 people in the diag that afternoon. And the, the woman lawyer that stopped me and said, I'm 60 years old. I've never been involved in politics before. And she didn't vote for Hillary, she didn't vote. And I'll never make that mistake again. And there were, the same day I, I posted this for some of you, we were down river getting ready to launch a canvas. And one of the now famous Trump caravans came in with the pickup trucks and the flags flying and proud to be an American um, blaring. But there were three women there in their seventies. One was celebrating their 74th birthday. They'd never been involved in politics before. And they were, for those of you who did the voter guide, they were delivering the voter guide. They'd never done. They were in their 70s and they were going door to door to deliver the voter's guide. And they too had never been involved in politics again. They don't like being called suburban women. They were very clear. They wish the pollster would lose that label, but they care. But that doesn't mean that every man here didn't make a difference too. There were women that didn't like Hillary Clinton last four years ago that did turn out this time. But I think we all have to take a deep breath and we have to look at why people are, I know that there are people that don't like Donald Trump's vitriolicness, don't like his bullying, don't like his language, don't like anything about the way he acts, but still voted for him because they think Democrats look down their nose at union workers. We need to really look at ourselves and how are we going to win? I do think that we should be, we need to be worried about the divide in this country. The, the one, another thing, thing that this election shows is we are divided. I think Joe Biden is the right person at the right time. I think he will heal the soul of this nation. I think he will work together to bring us together. And there are a lot of things that we all need. We need to solve COVID. I, ignoring it the way we have is not making it get better. We're all about to find ourselves inside again after we celebrate a beautiful weekend. The numbers this week have been staggering and Republicans have to be at that table. We need a COVID plan. We need to fix the damn roads. But not only do we need to fix the damn roads, which Republicans and Democrats want, potholes are not Democrat or Republican, blue or red, but we need broadband. It, Washington County needs an improvement in broadband as much as rural counties and urban cities do across this country. We gotta work together for that. We gotta find a way, you know, healthcare, too many people are paying too much for prescriptions, period. Republicans and Democrats agree on that. We gotta stop fighting. We gotta get people COVID relief. We've gotta stop fighting on that. And to the young people uh, and to the, I'm not gonna, I made the mistake of once saying young people, it's everybody. Everybody from 
John Deagle in 92 to the young children being born care about the environment. The Green New Deal is right in its goals. We've got to eliminate carbon. Who can't look at the hurricanes and the wildfires and not say they're real? But we got to, and I've already started this. I'm talking to the Sunrise kids, but I met yesterday with Gina McCarthy and the environmentalists. I've got the UAW. I've got, the, we're coming to the table. We got to come up with solutions. Then once we all come, we'll talk to the autos and the, um, and the, um, other people and build those coalitions. But now's the time to really decide what our priorities are and we can throw our hands in the air, we can call people bigots, we can or we can address and have uncomfortable conversations which we need to have about systematic racism. So I'm just going to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart but say we're at a time we got to get some things done. We can't afford to be so bitterly divided anymore. There are real problems that are crying for solutions. And I'll tell you something, if you go back to the civil rights bill in the early 60s, which was the first ma major movement on racism, it was Southern Republican judges that actually did what had to happen in many places. So instead of demonizing each other, yes, we had another elections down the road and we're gonna have to roll up our sleeves and keep working. But in the meantime, let's look at ourselves and say, why did we lose some of those voters? And let's do some things that bring them back home. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Debbie. Appreciate that. Wise words, indeed. Um, Larry Kestenbaum, you are uh, on deck. Or you are ready to go. Um, we have asked Larry today. He's our county clerk, of course. And we've asked him to just to give us a bit of an overview of uh, how things went in Washtenaw County and sort of his perspective on how the election went. So Larry, take it away. We had, we had an amazing election. It was, uh, you know, the turnout was, was unprecedented. Uh, the, uh, the number of, uh, of absentee ballots was wildly unprecedented. Uh, it was uh, beyond anything we had, had been seen before in, in Michigan. Um, um, the, uh, uh, and, and it was done. I, I was, I was, uh, I was, t I was uh, basically uh, 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 reassuring people before the election. I said, Washtenaw County will be all counted on election night. And it was at 3:30 in the morning. We had all of the votes counted and posted online, uh, and uh, and and that Joe Biden had won Washtenaw County by more than a hundred thousand votes, which is which which is also amazing. Uh, and um, and and I, I for a, for a, for a moment I thought that that we basically made the statewide difference. If the uh, if the uh, uh, if it was less than 100,000 statewide, then it was basically Washtenaw County versus the rest of the state. But as it turns out, uh, and, and fortunately, uh, the uh, the statewide margin was bigger than just 100,000 votes. So the uh, um, but uh, the uh, uh, you know Democrats won uh, on a lot of township offices, including in places where we that Democrats had not won before. Uh, and the um, uh, there's there's a uh, the, the county board uh, we basically proved that that 2018 was not a fluke that uh, all nine county board districts are are now have uh, continue to have Democrats representing them um, and uh, and and we have an outstanding county board um, I'm I'm uh, uh, and the new people coming in are, uh, are I think I have I I have. I have great hopes for them. Uh, Carolyn Sanders and Justin Hodge are the new commissioners from uh, um, uh, uh, Pittsfield and Ypsilanti Townships, respectively. Um, and the uh, we had we had again in the in the county we had we had counting boards in all but four jurisdictions. Uh, we had fifteen hundred poll workers countywide uh, uh, working on all the precincts and all the counting boards. Uh, it was, uh, and, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, after the election, we have the Board of Canvassers, just two Democrats and two Republicans who meet to basically examine all the precincts and certify the election. And that's a, a um, uh, you know, a very involved process, oftentimes finding out, you know, all the mistakes that were made and, and, and dealing with, you know, essentially making sure that if there's a recount that all the precincts are going to be recountable. And the uh, uh, and that you know we can take up to fourteen days for the canvas, but the uh, the uh, canvas uh, was done. Uh, I mean, it's done already, and we're uh, uh, the 
with me. The number of problems that were uh, that were found were relatively um, minimal. I mean, compared to uh, what it uh, sometimes has been. So the uh, my sincere, humble thanks to everyone. Uh, um, uh, I'm seeing a, a question on the on the chat of what would make a precinct unrecountable. Um, Michigan has this peculiar folkway, which I thought, you know, after the presidential recount in 2016, people would say, you know, we don't need this. 49 other states get by without the concept of a precinct being unrecountable. But in Michigan, we have various arbitrary rules that, for example, if the number of ballots and the number of um, the number of, in the poll book and so forth, if all, all the, the, you know, the count, all these different counts of how many people voted, if those things don't match, you're not allowed to recount the precinct. And so the original election night count stands uh, and the, uh, you can't go and look at the ballots. Um, and that's, you know, basically the, the, the precincts that, that most need to be looked at, you're not allowed to look at in a recount. Uh, and that's uh, uh, a rule which is, Tremendously outmoded, and it was it was seen as 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 really politically untouchable uh, uh, for a long time. But the um, uh, after you know, the, and 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 former election director Chris Thomas once said, you know, one of these days we're going to have a a, a recount in Michigan that has national attention, and the national media is going to come up against the concept of unrecountability, and it's going to be ugly. You know, because again, this unrecountability thing is a Michigan-specific folkway, okay? Which, which, and and the the it's based on the idea that if there's some difference, then maybe somebody tampered with the ballot since the election or something like that. But anyway, the the um, uh, and so we had the presidential uh, recount in 2016, and half of Detroit was unrecountable uh, because they uh, the Wayne County Board of Canvassers didn't have time to go through and fix everything in, in Detroit. Uh, and examine all the precincts and and and, and remedy the, the you know, mistakes that were made, uh, and and there may have been some issues of poll worker training and things like that. This time, uh, there was a tremendous amount of attention to helping. You know, Detroit has always struggled with uh, getting elections done, uh, and the uh, the state was involved in providing people and resources and training and so forth to help Detroit uh, 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 get the election done. It's a gigantic task. You think about how big Detroit is how many poll workers they have, how many precincts they have, how many absentee ballots they have. They have, as, as, as I, I'm sorry, I still call it the Cobo Hall. They have the, you know, the, their, uh, uh, all the uh, counting boards and, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, there was an attempt to have the Brooks Brothers riot again of pounding on the window to, try, to stop counting. Uh, but the, uh, uh, it, it's a tremendous challenge to, to run elections in a place, uh, place like Detroit. Uh, for all those reasons, and uh, uh, but it was done, and it was, and it's. Uh, 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 I think it's a, it's a great accomplishment. But but the the uh, uh, but I thought after the, in the wake of the of the 2016 recount that we were actually as a state going to be able to move forward and abolish unrecountability, and and all that the state legislature did, the Republican-controlled state legislature, was to raise the fee on recounts. So that Jill Stein wouldn't be able to do that again, uh, and the um, uh, and so now the shoe is on the other foot. I see Republicans saying we need a hand recount of the whole state. Go ahead, but it's going to cost you because it's they raised the uh, the recount fee to two hundred and fifty dollars a precinct. A few years ago, it was ten dollars a precinct. Um, so uh, anyway, that's uh, uh, the the uh, I, I I'm grateful for everyone who who assisted. I'm grateful for the uh, 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 for the result that we got, and and uh, I'm um, I'm not. I don't think there's there's anything uh, I, I I to complain about. I think that, that that we did fantastically. Larry, thank you very much, and just on behalf of the rest of the county, thank you for your uh, your hard work, and 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 please give our your team uh, our 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 gratitude because we are very thankful that it went so well here, and that uh, you know. And we can and, have and the, this, we can dominate things and, and it, it's legit and we don't have to have anybody questioning it. <laughs> and in the midst of this also, I, 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 I should say, I was, I was reelected to a fifth term and I do appreciate everyone's support. Thank you. You betcha. All right, thank you, sir. All right, with that, I'm going to change Larry to an attendee. So joining me today as a co-panelist, and by the way, if, you, if you're wondering why you can't see everybody that's here, 
uh, on this meeting. There are 80 participants right now. That is because this is a webinar and not a, a Zoom meeting. And webinars have panelists. So the, the five people you see on your screen right now, or at least they're some of their, uh, some of us are by name only, um, are the panelists. And we are going to um, fill various roles as we move forward to the rest of this meeting. <clears throat> Uh, Jim McCargar is uh, somebody, he lives here in Dexter uh, near me, and he's got experience in uh, running Zoom meetings where there's, um, you know, something being considered and there are people um, expressing varying viewpoints. And so he's agreed to help us sort of uh, manage this so that everything goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, Eli Nathans is, of course, uh, one of our um, program's co-vice chairs, and he's got experience running Zoom webinars in general. Uh, Teresa Reed has agreed to be our parliamentarian today so that we uh, do things all by the rules. And Greg Hafer is the person who is uh, going to put forward the motion um, regarding the, the um, bylaws update. Um, just before we get into it, I just wanna uh, share with you some history on this. Um, Greg, uh, Erica Terry and I, and probably that's about it, maybe a couple other people uh, began discussing um, over a year ago now um, how unwieldy the executive board uh, for the Washtenaw Dems has become. We had at one point in this last two year cycle over 30 people on the board. That means that we had almost half the number of people on the board as we have on the executive committee that chooses the board. Um, and when it comes to just getting things done quickly and, and facilely uh, so that we can move uh, in, in, you know, with the sort of speed that we need to do to get things done sometimes, um, having to, you know, count votes by email and stuff where that many people uh, is very challenging. Um, it also becomes just a generally a, a hard um, thing to manage as a, you know, I as chair and the rest of the officers sort of should be seen as the managers of this group. And, and the more people you've got in this group, the, just the, more, the bigger challenges it is, the more opportunities for interpersonal problems that might, uh, might come about. Um, and we just needed, it felt like there was a need to uh, bring this down to a more reasonable level um, and so those discussions began and Greg Hafer has taken, uh, taken on the task of putting together a, a, pr a proposal that takes us down to, I think, 19 people on the board if we fill every position and really is a lot more um, uh, sort of intuitive and uh, logical in terms of uh, having people uh, in management positions to take care of specific tasks that need to be done. Um, so while this is, um, not my proposal, it is Greg's proposal. Uh, I have been involved in, and I'm fully supportive of it. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over now to Greg to discuss, um, A, you know, what, what in general he's proposing and B, uh, any changes that were made since uh, the last time uh, we sent out uh, the, um, the proposal. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Is that okay, Greg? Would that be helpful to have the... Actually, Chris, can we do two things first? Can we agree on the, um, the way the meeting's going to be run and then also have a motion on the table? Yeah, so go ahead and do that. Okay, I want to get really clear about what it is that we're talking about um, all of these times. So uh, first, we want to be clear about um, the use of Robert's rules, which, as most of you know, are designed ancient, for one thing, and they're designed to, to make meetings run smoothly at the same time as allowing everybody to have a chance to be heard, but not to dominate a conversation. And I know we've all had experiences in meetings through the years where we really wish, you know, we were using Robert's rules. So I just wanna be clear about the, um, the standard rule in Robert's rules of order is that um, individuals can speak and debate twice on any debatable motion during the same meeting for up to 10 minutes each. And the order in which people can speak is that those who haven't been heard from speak before repeat speakers. Um, and those with a different opinion speak before, uh, you know, before people who want to just repeat or add on to already expressed opinions. And then it's in the order of hands raised. So that's on Jim to kind of keep track of who's already spoken and, um, and who hasn't. Um, but we can adopt special rules. And so this committee has been thinking about, you know, two times, 10 minutes, that's really a lot. Um, so we move, the committee moves, um, that uh, we change the rules for this meeting so that every individual has three opportunities to speak for three minutes each time. Um, also, um, the other divergence from the 
uh, cheat sheet we sent you or Chris sent you um, is that um, it says that that sheet says we need a majority vote to move any motion. Um, the nature of our business, changing the bylaws requires a two thirds vote. So just to clarify that. But the opening motion is uh, proposing three opportunities to speak uh, three minutes each time. So we need a second for that motion, then we can discuss and vote. Do we have a second? Jim, you're, wa you're watching that and you're muted. Sorry. Uh, if you wish to uh, just, if you're on the phone and not um, able to press buttons and such, if you're just joining by phone only, um, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, if you are recognized and star nine uh, is, is the way to raise your hand to be recognized. So uh, if you are on the phone and not on, a, um, not on the, uh, the Zoom app on your phone or your laptop, um, that's the way you can um, be recognized. Janet was the second, Chris. All right, so we have, All right. let me actually write this down. Okay, so we have a second, um, we have a motion on the table and to adopt these, um, these revised Robert's rules. Uh, is there any discussion? Well, so please uh, folks, if you have raised your hand uh, because you want a second or something like that, would you please put it down once the um, action is completed and, and therefore I'll not be confused as to who really wants to speak. All right, uh, we have no hands raised right now. Okay, so I am going to start the poll. Uh, da, 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 da. Where's my link? There it is. Okay, I'm going to launch the poll and then you, okay, wait a minute, we have, nope, no raised hands. All right, so the poll, you should be able to see a poll on your screen now and you are able to vote. And we'll let this go for just a couple of minutes. Now, Chris, it says hosts and panelists cannot vote. That is correct. Uh, all right, yeah, I, that's a mistake that I, let me see. We'll just have to record those separately. That was a toggle that I didn't untoggle, so I apologize for that. Okay, I'd like to just point out while people are, are voting, um, with a three minute rule, I'll keep, uh, I'll keep um, time and we'll give a 30 second sign and we'll give a stop sign when your time's close, when your time's up. I like Honestly, I- That screen share there, Teresa, that's very, very, very cool. I like that. Oh, good. Thanks. I wish I had Greg's little stop sign. But oh yeah, where's my? <laughs> he wasn't able to email that to me. So yeah, <laughs> yeah show us your stop sign. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna give it 30 more seconds. If you have oh, yeah. yet. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. And we have um, 50, 58 yes, two no, chair votes yes. Uh, Teresa, how do you vote? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jim? Thumbs up, yes. Eli? Uh, yes. Okay, so we have 63 uh, yes and two no. All right, and I'm going to share these results. So we are going to adopt these rules. All right. There is the results plus the uh, the five panelists that are not able to vote because I goofed up. All right. Um, all right. So next up, uh, Greg, why don't you take it away? All right. Well, I will first move to adopt the proposed bylaw changes and for those changes to take effect at the conclusion of the county convention on November 23rd, 2020. So that is the motion. Um, and one thing I'll just say, because I sent out multiple emails, the, the first email went out in September, September 26th. But like Chris said, we were working on these for a while. And uh, since then, we actually got some feedback and we changed those things. Uh, the, the two 
Well, I see there's a, there's a few small things that were changed. Uh, we changed the name of the uh, executive committee to county committee to better align with the MVP rules. Um, so that's one thing that's, that was updated that was available on the website when we did change that and was sent out in the newsletters uh, that's different than the September 26th email. Uh, another thing is we clarified the language uh, for the endorsements. There's one thing that we added for endorsements. Now, I know a lot of people, and I've said this, that we need to have a, a bigger discussion about the endorsement process. But one change that we did put in there is that the candidates who didn't qualify for endorsement, like Joe Biden, because he doesn't live in Michigan and he can't be an MDP member and therefore can't be endorsed, we fixed that, right? So I don't, you know, overwhelming majority of people, you know, think that, yeah, we should probably endorse the top of the ticket. So that's one change that we had in there. There was feedback on that, that it, the wording made it sound like it was automatic, that we didn't even vote on it. So we, we changed the wording for that as well. But almost everything that's in there now is, oh, and the other thing was for removal of officers, we made it a little more clear and more objective uh, on the conditions for the removal of an officer. So it's not as open-ended. So those are probably, those are the three things that I can think of that changed since the initial proposal was sent out on September 26th. But um, the biggest focus I, I, people are talking about is the, the consolidation of some of the committees, which would result in the board being uh, a little bit smaller. But there are dozens and dozens of other changes in there as well to make the bylaws more accessible. Uh, the formatting changes, standardiza standardization and wording, making sure it aligns with the MVP bylaws, uh, the way we number things, um, phrasing, redundancies were removed. So there's all kinds of other things in there that help to make the bylaws more transparent and more accessible to general membership. So, you know, other organizations will do an annual or a biannual review of bylaws and go through and see what works, what doesn't work, um, what doesn't make sense. And that's kind of what we did with the, those changes to make it more accessible. Um, and so one way to think about it is that this is really, those changes are really foundational changes that allow people to make renovations later or add an extension or put a pool in the backyard, right? And then maybe four years from now, right? The kids moved out, we don't use the pool, we can turn it into a pond or fill it in and make a garden, right? So these changes are put in place to help us operate a little bit more smoothly and efficiently and actually allow for changes that uh, help us make informed decisions. So we're not confused and put off by the bylaws or you know, in, in certain scenarios where people are like, why bother? I don't want to deal with the WCDP. There's a dozen other volunteer organizations I can hang out at, you know? So that's, that's, that's a major part of, of these bylaw changes as well. In addition to uh, the big substantive changes like consolidating committees and putting in a procedure for removing officers, which we didn't have before, um, making it official. This is another thing that's in here, making it official that the chair of the Black Caucus is actually a member of the executive board. That was passed by the executive committee, but it was never actually changed in the bylaws because that requires a general membership vote. And the chair of the Black Caucus and the, the WCDP Black Caucus functions a lot like a standing committee, right? They serve a dual role and they really need a seat at the table. And so that's another thing that's in here. So there's all kinds of changes in here that are going to help us become a better party moving forward. I'm going to uh, second um, Greg's motion. And before we get into discussion, um, I just want to say a few things. Um, it is my in, uh, sincere belief that for um, this county party, which has grown in such dramatic ways over the last six to eight years, for us to function effect effectively and continue to build on this, we need to um, have the board positions be uh, held by people who are good managers. Um, it, it's, we, years ago, when I first joined the board, 
uh, we had, I think, a dozen people on the board. And each one of us had a task, and we did that ourselves. That was it. We just did that thing ourselves. And so, you know, Karen Costamo did all of the, the button sales and, and, and the, you know, the bumper stickers and the, uh, the farmer's market. And the, the, the person that was in charge of precinct organizing, that was, they were the only person doing it. Over time, we started to institute um, co-chairs so that we had more than one person doing it. But for so long, it still continued to be mostly those people doing it. And it's been only because we, we made it a sincere effort to build teams around these people so that they could, you know, they weren't doing everything. They were managing teams of people to do that, that we've been able to expand this program to, to do the kinds of things that we're doing today. And if you want to look at the prime example of this, it's the precinct organizing committee. Uh, this year, under the, the leadership of Teresa and Janet and Steve, they have created, I would say, at least three levels, probably four levels of three levels of management with the precinct organizers and precinct delegates um, as the fundamental, you know, building block of that. But they've got uh, a handful of people who are in charge of very specific tasks like mobil voter mobilization and communications and stuff. And then they've got area captains who are responsible for geographical areas. And this hierarchy has made them able to do things very, fairly quickly because the, the information gets, uh, gets disseminated up and down that, that chain fairly quickly. So um, this is a model for, in my opinion, the rest of the board and all of the positions. And it's, it's going to be important that we fill these positions that the executive committee that we choose uh, on the 23rd is really thoughtful about filling these positions with people who are good at managing other people and teams of people. Um, one of the things that's going to happen is that we are going to lose uh, positions on the board. This is un intentional because um, it's, it's become unwieldy in my opinion. But what I'm, one of the things that, that happens when we do that is a, it, it'll, it reduces the, um, the ability for us to keep a very diverse board in terms of um, gender makeup, gender uh, uh, identity, uh, racial makeup, ge geographical uh, demographics, all these things are super important for us to have all of this different representation on the board so that we are um, seeing everything as, in as clear a way as possible because it's hard to do that uh, unless you have that sort of diversity. So we're going to have to be very deliberate um, uh, when we do this. Um, the second thing is that it means that we're the, there are people on the board right now whose voices we need to hear, but will not be on the board as um, uh, to be able to vote. And I'm one of the things that we were that is under discussion right now uh, among um, some of the the officers and, and other folks on the board is to create an advisory board of people who are able to give um, feedback to the board, feedback that they're giving now as a voting member. Um, they would be invited to the meetings and we would have probably every other month meetings to hear from them to make sure that we are, um, you know, that, that we're getting all of the inputs that we need to have. Um, that might be the entire executive committee as it exists now, would it be called the county committee or could be a subset of that. Uh, it could be people who are on the board now who uh, will not be on the board when we elect the new board um, in December. But uh, I think it's very important that we maintain um, this level of input from people who have experience uh, with the, the county party over a long period of time and also have deep roots into the community so that we're getting those, uh, those perspectives and making good decisions on behalf of the party um, as the board, you know, with that input. So the, I just want to... And, and this proposal actually makes it easier to do that than under the current bylaws. Okay. That's right because we can create subcommittees and, and ad hoc committees quickly as, as are needed and then dissolve them after that. Uh, I had uh, one question that somebody raised is, how do you vote by phone? If you are on by phone only, um, I will uh, call upon you uh, to, you can raise your hand. I, I'll call upon you at that point when we get to the point where we're, um, when we're voting. And we have two people that are on uh, by phone only. Okay, now I'm going to open it up for discussion. Loretta Coddington, you have your hand up. Oh, you don't anymore. Is there any discussion or comments? And please do not do this in the chat. Please do this by raising your hand. Um, okay, I'm going to go with Laura Nathan. You are on. This is Barry, not Laura. I use Laura's okay. link. Gotcha. Barry, go for it. Just this may be obvious, but does this mean that this decision will be made by this group today 
Yes, that's what this, that's what we're doing. Yep. And this group today is, is composed of the those who are in attendance, the entire uh, membership of the county party. Yeah, in order to be on this meeting today, you had to be credentialed, which means you had to meet the requirement of 30 days MDP membership or, you know, meet the waiver or whatever. Um, we have, right now we have 79 uh, participants and all of them have been credentialed. So the, the um, I'm going to share my screen really quick. So, um, uh, oops, I can show you, let me just bring it up. Um, at, All right. Am I still heard? Yeah. Yes. I yeah. At the risk of showing that I haven't read everything you send me, um, was there notice well in advance that this proposal would be made at this meeting? Yeah, we've been doing yes. This. The the first notice went out September twenty sixth, and then almost every newsletter since then had a, a notification or a reminder of the proposal. And yep. Greg did a thirty minute video explaining. Um, what the essential core changes were. Yep. Um, and it's on the landing page of the website. Yes, it was put on the landing page of the website, sent out in September in the newsletter, subsequent newsletters. Yep, and there was a video on our, our YouTube. So this okay. is- Sorry uh, for, for that. That's no problem. Okay. Uh, others probably have that same question. I've, I brought up, I'm sharing my screen to show you our current bylaws and um, there are some requirements there. One is that they first be referred to the Rules and Bylaws Committee uh, and the Executive Committee, and both of those things were done over the last month or two. Um, they, in order to pass these bylaws, uh, we will have to do it by a two-thirds majority vote of members of the WCDP membership pr present at a meeting, provided their written notice was given two weeks ahead of time, blah, blah, blah. So we did that. Actually, we did it far, far longer than two weeks. We did it almost two months in advance. One of the reasons we did that, and I think Greg will agree with me, is that we wanted to make sure that when we presented this proposal today, that we had good buy-in already, that people understood what they're voting on, and that um, they, they had been able to give feedback, and that we could sort of work out any bugs, you know, unintentional consequences are the biggest fear that we have when you, when you do bylaws changes, is that you introduce something that creates a situation like we had uh, with our endorsement that were, you know, you couldn't endorse theoretically uh, the president, uh, the presidential candidates, for example, that was an unintended consequence uh, that we had fixed, but we didn't want to introduce any further unintentional conse unintended consequences. So we wanted to get this out there and have a lot of people looking at it mm -hmm. and getting us feedback. And we have made some adjustments based on that. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. we weren't trying to sneak anything through. We, we sent it out early. Like Chris said, we got feedback and, Everybody who sent feedback, we we implemented in some respect. So, okay, Barry, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You betcha, Chris. Would you please uh, um, just for a moment, folks, if you could please, if you're aware of them, use Roberts to the extent you can to identify whether yours is a point of information uh, or actually a comment relevant to the particular motion because I'm charging people their uh, their their use of time before I let someone else speak here. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, Eric Terry, you are on. Hello. Um, I am not sure, but I think this is a point of information. Um, part of the reason that I went on the campaign uh, to poke uh, everybody until I got to Greg, who would actually do the work, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that <laughs> I was... Uh, trying to get a CRM for, to help manage volunteers. We knew we were exploding. I thought there was a chance we might have 800 to 1,000 volunteers by 2020 and 2018, and I only underestimated that by about 3,300 people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we had over uh, 4,000 people. We have over 4,000 people in our database with over 1,800 signups just since the August primary. So part of that was that I was on the board at the time and I was trying to talk to each member of the board or at least each committee. When that's 31 people, mm -hmm. that is a lot of work um, and put me in a position to be both frustrated and grateful for every person who didn't get back to me. Um, and it made it extremely clear that if you want a board to function as a steering committee, you need to be able um, to actually know each other in some functional way. Um, and, you know, if the chair was going to try to meet with one person a week, that was going to take 
him or her nine to 10 months. Um, <laughs> even if they tried to be um, more judicious and meet with only each committee once a month, they were still only going to meet with each committee twice in a two-year term. Um, and that a steering committee needs, needs closer contact than that. Also, um, there, there's been sort of a habit, which makes sense based on the history Chris said, that um, if you're like a super duper volunteer, like people encourage you to get on the board. Well, if you're a super duper volunteer, you're putting in maybe 10 to 30 hours a week, five to 30 hours a week, depending on the time of the year. Well, to be even a basically engaged board member is another five to 15 hours. Um, so as the organization, like as, just to reiterate what Chris said, at a really practical level, the changes in the organization made this uh, a merciful necessity um, without wanting to ever create a situation where there aren't volunteers on the board. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, you I have 30 wanna, seconds. I held up the wrong thing. Seconds. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Erica. <laughs> I, really I didn't mean do to wanna, cut you off. I really do want to thank Erica for, uh, for really kind of getting the ball rolling on this and all the work that she did early on with it. So um, besides that, the work that Erica did during this, this past six to nine months in terms of getting this database up and then just wrangling the the membership the way, or the volunteers the way she did uh, is really nothing short of a miracle. So uh, just hearty round of applause for me and on behalf of everybody for Erica's work. Uh, thanks so much, Erica. All right, um, stable talking. All right, uh, Jim Johnson, you are up. Thank you. Um, I think this is a point of information. I'm not sure what that is quite, but. Um, the question I have is relative to the, the addition of new committees. What happens, uh, do we have a, a, a way to function if a committee is not fully uh, filled? And, and uh, you know, in the, in the case of adding new committees and then building a hierarchy of, of uh, management, um, what happens when we're missing a layer or a key component. Thank you. So uh, the formation of committees to make a standing committee would would require um, we could just we would do something similar to what we're doing here where we would um, someone would propose a new committee and then we would vote on it we we would create a new committee um, and that would be something that would be added to the bylaws. Um, if if you're asking about what happens if someone vanishes or disappears. That's one of the th reasons that we put in a section about removal of officers, for example. So if someone's elected to a vice chair position and say communications, right? It's very clear in the bylaws that I'm supposed to put out a newsletter. If I'm like, I don't wanna put out a newsletter, uh, then I'm violating the bylaws that say I'm responsible for my duties. And if I fail to do my duties, I will be, I can be removed from office with a two thirds vote. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, 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 to some extent, but what if we cannot fill the communications director's position? Then what happens? We will fill it. Yeah. <laughs> the, executive, the executive committee. Well, I mean, that, that, that's all I'm saying is what if we cannot? Because that, is, that is the responsibility of the executive committee or what will be called the county committee if these bylaws rules pass. I mean, that is, that's a, that's a team of 66 people that will identify somebody from Washtenaw County mm -hmm. to fill that. And if they really wanted to, they could, with the new bylaws that are being proposed, we could put together a special committee or an ad hoc committee to do a, a search. Um, in the past, you know, through communications, we've sent out um, job descriptions, essentially, like a wanted ad in our, our newsletter saying, we need people to run for these board positions. So that could be something that could be done at the board level where we put a special committee together to try to find people to fill those positions. We also now have this Orion database that, um, that Erica was speaking of. And when we were looking for people to staff the office in Ypsilanti, um, she was able to target, and we, we were trying to get some diversity there in ter terms of age. And Erica was literally able to target, um, you know, people under the age, a certain age, for example, um, young people primarily, um, and with an email, you know, seeking volunteers and literally got like two dozen or three dozen. So go ahead, Teresa. I think that I, I, I think I hear Jim asking, though, about like if if the organization is in violation of its own bylaws, if we're not able to do 
what the bylaws say we need to do. Is that right, Jim? Yeah, I think that's, you know, in, in the times, just, just to, uh, in the case where we don't have as many volunteers as we have today, and, and things are a little tighter for executing our, our duties, what do we do then? Uh, and, and I think by the, by the statement you made, Greg, about um, having the, the basic functions to, to be able to change and, and, and create, you know, new committees or temporary committees that sort of answered the question, we'll be able to move and change to meet the situation. So I, I think that answers my question. Thank I will you. say that we, we've, we've rarely had a situation where we didn't have um, people to, to step up. Um, but there are times when we have vacancies and, and, and they, those vacancies exist for a period of time while we're searching. But that doesn't really put us out of compliance with the bylaws as long as we are actively seeking to fill those vacancies. So, right. and, I th and one of the changes is that we can put those, like we can put those search committees together uh, from the board level. We don't have to wait till that uh, executive committee, which meets very rarely. Um, so, you. That's right. yeah. Okay, Jim, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I am going to disable talking. Hetty Briggs, you are up. Hetty Briggs, there you go. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for all your hard work. Um, I just wanted to make sure, and I think Lisa kind of answered me, uh, I wanted to make sure that um, we are actually going to see the changes with the strikeouts and kind of a, like a real what has actually changed in each item before we're voting on it. Because as you're worried about it, the devil is in the detail and it's in the language, right? I just wanted to make sure that I have an overall feeling of all the things that will be changed. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure when we're voting, we can see exactly- No, we're not gonna do that. We, we put these out two months ago, so that's, we're not gonna- but Yeah, if, too comprehensive. It would, it, would not, it would be unreadable if we tried to do that. Let's yeah, one of, the, one of the things, one of the first things I, I mentioned was dozens and dozens of smaller changes. Right. And that involved some things weren't, weren't the substance didn't change, but there would be things like um, moving the description of what the vice chairs do from the descriptions of the committees, um, formatting changes, uh, spelling changes, uh, standardizing things. So it's not like a hyphen or a colon or a period in one paragraph, uh, margin changes. Uh, we've changed individual words, verb tenses. Um, there's there's dozens and dozens of those changes. So, one of the reasons um, normally that's a, I completely agree. Like I if if it was you know we've had bylaw changes in the past where you know we voted item by item, and I think that's that's it's super important to do that. But for something of this magnitude. Um, to get around that. That's one of the reasons that we did put it out so early and we did ask for people to have feedback. So a lot of the uh, newsletters I sent out, I sent out the, uh, the current bylaws and the proposed bylaws. So people could do a side by side and look through those. And, and that way it would, make, um, it would make this meeting a lot smoother. So if there was something that people didn't agree with, they could have sent me feedback ahead of time or um, if there is something that, that people don't agree with, they can make a motion during this meeting to, to change that. Um, Go ahead, Teresa. Well, I was gonna just say that also um, a, lot of the, a lot of the specifics are detailed in the 30 minute video that Greg produced. Yeah. So a lot of the, this information is, is very much Those big there, changes so. are in that video, so, yeah. So it was two months ago. Can these bylaws then govern WCDB caucuses as it mentioned in 4.4? I'm not sure they. I don't think there are. There's no mention of caucuses, but that is covered by MDP rules. So the only mention of the caucuses is the uh, inclusion of the chair of the Black Caucus as a board member. All right, um, Michelle Dietrich, you are up. You are muted, Michelle. Michelle Dietrich, you need to unmute. I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. Go yeah, sorry, I unmuted and it muted me again. Apologize about that. 
Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, caucuses are mentioned like under 3.10. And so um, I don't understand the relationship of the caucuses to the to WCDP, um, whether, and I think there's some other mentions of caucuses and some of these rules applying. And maybe those are just brought down, all of the, maybe all of those are just brought down from, um, from MDP, like there's in section 4.4, there's a mention of caucuses. Uh, and I mean, there's just many, if you, if you search the document. So are the caucuses chartered by, um, WCDP? Yes. They yeah. are. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, really the same way that uh, the MDP itself has, you know, multiple caucuses. Um, we are also able to have that. Uh, as of right now, we only have the black caucus, but theoretically you could have an environmental caucus or an LGBT caucus or, or whatever you wanted to do. I mean, it can happen. Um, and that, that may be something that going forward, as we get become a much larger organization that, you know, that, that becomes more of a, more of a thing basically. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm bringing it up in part because it's an actually an issue at the DNC level. Um, and just a recommendation that going forward, thinking about these rules, maybe formalizing how that happens and which of these rules apply. Because like section 9.1 now applies to um, endorsements, which I agree with totally, that the WCDP will not make endorsements in a primary and the caucuses also will not if it's contested or may be contested. But um, in that case, it seems like there should be some formalization of how. Okay, how that's yeah, going forward. Right. So Some that's, the, that's yeah. going forward. In terms of the mechanics of it, I think it would be covered by the MVP rule, but in terms of the nuanced things like that, endorsements, that's a good idea. So we should think about that going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's all I had to say. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, Janet Cannon, you are up. Hang on, there you go. Can I, can I nerd out and can I be yeah. out of order? Uh, when I first moved to Michigan and I didn't know anybody, I didn't know what I was doing, right? I went to an Abdul Al Sayed rally for that 2018 election. And the <laughs> Shell Dietrich <laughs> was in line shaking hands and giving out flyers. And she's the first person that I talked to that was connected to the Democratic Party. So she's one of the reasons I'm here today is Michelle Dietrich. I, Thank you, Michelle. That woman's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jenny, uh, was, go ahead. Okay, I think it's two points of information. So my first question, which I should have thought to ask a little sooner. Well, no, the first one's an easy one. I just wondered if you can tell us what the existing, oh, it's two questions, sorry about that. The existing rules uh, committee has has um, had input in what they think what their position is our, our rules and resolutions uh, they, they didn't give us many feedback yeah okay so we we notified them there was no uh, <laughs> feedback and then so we presented but we still presented at the the executive committee uh, mm -hmm. for our bylaws and that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what we reported we reported we on what the change we also sent it to the MDP and they sent it back saying, we would love to share this with all the rest of the county parties. In That's Michigan. a good point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I was not very clear about how the rules and rules and um, resolutions function will fit into the new structure. Maybe I, I didn't see where to read that in. That Basically, if, if needed, we would create a subcommittee to handle any specific instance, but otherwise, in general, it would be handled by the officers or uh, by deferring to the MDP themselves. Okay. And, and one thing I'd really, I keep talking about this because we, the endorsement meeting is, is um, or how we do endorsements, I think we really want to look at closely. And that's one of those things where I think changes like that, because they're so contentious, would involve the formation of a special committee to look at those kinds of res bylaws changes. Um, and we could do that for resolutions and other things like that. Okay, and the other part of the question was, I'm going to, to the caucus questions. Um, currently, we only do have the Black Caucus. Would the um, inclusion as members of the executive committee extend to if other caucuses are chartered? You mean the vice chair, if there's a chair of a, an additional caucus, would they be included on the? Right, 
Right. I should have asked that one a long time ago, and I forgot. They would not. And that, you know, that was one of the, the arguments against it um, doing when the, the executive committee added the Black Caucus was that it wasn't, it wasn't a, sorry, I shouldn't say it was an argument against it. It was something that I cautioned them that in the future, if other caucuses are formed, we need to be aware of why the Black Caucus is given the special treatment. And it's largely because the Black Caucus is almost guaranteed to be larger in terms of the number of people involved than any other caucus would be. So they, and they, they also represent a larger um, sort of sub-segment or demographic of our membership. So yeah, um, that was acknowledged when they, when they formed that. Okay. It, it, it could be in the future, say we had an LGBTQ caucus and it got huge and influential, then, you know, at some point later in, in the future, we could potentially add them, but that's not uh, contemplated. Yeah, because the wording is specifically the, the chair of the, the Black Caucus. So like Chris just said, it would have to go through the same process and it would, it would be a, a bylaw change, it would be a two thirds vote by the general membership to include that person. I will say that um, even before the Black Caucus uh, became formal, the chair of the Black Caucus formally became a member of the executive board, um, we had included those, the chair and the vice chair of the Black Caucus uh, on our Google group so that they were getting all the emails so that they were aware of what was happening at the board level in terms of just the conversations that were being had. Um, and they are invited to all of the meetings. And I would anticipate that if we have uh, additional caucuses formed later that we would do something similar to that because I mean it, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier about having this advisory board uh, of people who are not voting members of the board but have valuable uh, input to give us that would go you know the, the caucuses would really be a perfect example of that actually we would need to be hearing from those people so it's really smart to have them at least uh, have a seat at the table um, so that we can can hear from them and they can give their input and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, Deepa Cholton, apparently, excuse me, I, I miss said that. Deepa Gold has a question apparently, but does not have the electronic hand. Okay. Um, let me find her. Okay, I can, all right. Uh, all right, Deepa, you are able to talk now. Oh, you have to, um, there you go. Yep, you're good. Deepa, go ahead. Deepa, you are unmuted and have the ability to talk. So this is your time. I was going to suggest that since we have Joe Biden on our team, welcome to him. I have a question about, are we just doing Washington community Democrats membership? Is that one cohesive group? Do we all also de interact with the other democratic groups in Michigan? and then out of Michigan. Because sometimes different people may be doing things a little better or worse than us, and we can each gain from each other's uh, experience and inputs. Just a question that came to my mind as we talked sure. about Joe Biden. So I can, I, can, I can work with you on that question. Um, first of all, in terms of locally, we work very closely with the 12th District uh, Democrats and the 7th Congressional District Democrats. Um, because, you know, there we overlap into both of those um, congressional districts. Um, the precinct organizing committee, and this is particularly true in odd number of years when we're not staring down the, the barrel of, a, of an election. Um, they have a bit of what they were calling, I can't remember what they're called, the 83 county project or something or, um, but they, you know, there, there was a sincere effort to reach out to other county parties um, that were, you know, working to build their program and share some best practices with them. And I would say we probably got some feedback coming back in our direction too, but um, largely we're trying to be evangelistic about um, the success we've had primarily, or you know, especially with the precinct organizing committee and, and the work that they've done. So overall, you know, I think the, the answer to your question is yes, we do uh, try to work as much as we can um, to you know, spread the word about what we're doing and to learn from others. It is my considered opinion that the Michigan Democratic Party needs to be doing that um, on a much more dedicated and concerted effort. And that's something that uh, I will be speaking to Chair uh, Lavora Barnes about uh, in the coming weeks, because I think that it's very important um, that we're, that, you know, all of these different groups are sharing their best practices. There was some effort to do that uh, right after the 2018 election, I believe, um, but it, it, it hasn't really been sustained. And it, 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 it's a little hard to do because there are 82 uh, county parties. Wayne County does not have a county party, but all the other counties do. 
and they all operate at, at different levels of um, uh, engagement by their membership and, um, and, and efficiency or effectiveness by their leadership. Um, but you know, all of them, all of us can always be uh, improving and sharing good ideas. So it's a matter, just a matter of figuring out a mechanism for those county parties to um, to be able to you know communicate easily back and forth, whether it's a Slack channel or whatever. Um, but it's it's a great idea, uh, Deepa, and, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. I'd like so, to make sure that the uh, the future questions are germane to the motion on the table. Yeah, that's good. So we don't have any other uh, hands up. Um, so I uh, think we should uh, vote on this. So I'm going to bring up the poll uh, to uh, adopt the proposed bylaws as presented by Greg Hafer and I'll give it two minutes. So please vote. Um, if you are on the phone, Doug, Scott, I know you're out there. There's one other person. Um, I am going to allow the person whose digits are 249, last two digits are 249 to talk and please vote. Uh, yes, Doug Scott. Okay, that's Doug, thank you, Doug. And the person whose phone number is, ends in 283, would you please uh, cast your vote? There's somebody on by phone. Oh, you, you are muted. Let me, un let me unmute you here. Uh, I don't know how to do that, there we go. Um, if you are, if your number ends in 283, you can unmute by hitting, uh, sorry, uh, star six. Star six will unmute you. Um, for the person who's on with a phone number ending in 283, hit star six, and then you'll be able to uh, cast your vote. Chris, Loretta has- Yeah, we're, we're voting right now. So Loretta will have to wait till after we're done. Let's, let's, let's get this vote taken care of here. I was in part of uh, somebody's asking me how to vote. You should see on your screen, you should see a, a, a box that has appeared to allow you to vote. If you don't raise your hand and I will, uh, I will take your vote uh, verbally. Okay. You have, to, you have to pull the panelists. Yes, I will do that too. Rayanne, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Rayanne. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa? Yes. Uh, I vote yes. Uh, Jim? Yes. I'm going to put Greg down for a yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> officially, yes. <laughs> right. And Jim? Jim voted yes, but Eli. Or sorry, Eli, sorry, yes. Yes. Okay. Stop uh, the counting. All right. <laughs> if I'm winning, <laughs> stop the counting. You're at 87%. I'm giving it 30 more seconds. <laughs> 30 more seconds to vote. If I'm losing, keep counting. <laughs> yeah, no, there are zero no votes right now. <laughs> all right, I'm going to end the poll. And share the results. The vote is uh, I had eight. Awesome. Uh, eight plus 62 is 70 uh, yes votes and zero no votes. Um, thank you very much, people. I really appreciate it. Um, it's, I will, uh, we'll make sure that we get these published. I have to send them to the Wash or to the Michigan Democratic Party and then they post them on their website and that makes them official. But we will begin operating on them. Um, uh, starting uh, immediately after November 23rd. Greg, thank you very much on behalf yep. of the board and our entire membership, the amount of work you put into this. Uh, <laughs> I realize actually how much work you put into this and it, it really is a masterpiece. And I, I do hope that the MDP does share it with other county parties because I think it would really help a lot of other groups out in becoming more efficient. And, you know, bylaws are useless if they don't help you in moments of crisis and, <laughs> and, and, and problems, you know, that's really, yeah. I mean, when everything's going great, you rarely need your bylaws. But when some something comes up that uh, throws a monkey wrench uh, into the into the gears, that's when the bylaws uh, really come in. You know, to really become important, and these are going to really help us out with that. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We all owe you a big debt. Hundred percent. Okay. Um, uh, and also thanks to Erica, by the way, for sort of getting the ball rolling on this. Uh, yep. 
uh, early on. So For sure. and other people, uh, Robert George, um, uh, Justin Hodge, they also gave input. There were, you know, and then all the people that, that submitted feedback uh, starting after uh, we, we first published these, you know, just every little bit really contributed to make this a better, uh, a better document. So um, with that, I am going to end this meeting and we will talk to you again in December. Let's we have will... a motion to adjourn just to be uh, formal. Okay. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Before just we do that. Just to be please. formal. Sorry. But... <laughs> no, Let's do good welfare really quick. Um, if you have anything that you want to share, um, I'm going to just raise your hand. Um, I'm going to um, point out that um, the precinct organizing committee is going to be doing uh, some volunteer recognition uh, they will be doing an event for that, uh, for their volunteer team. Um, the party as a whole will be doing that uh, at the December general membership meeting. Um, and at that point, we'll also be soliciting feedback from our members on um, just how they, they sort of viewed things from the outside and how the operation looked to them and anything that, um, that they, they see that we could improve upon. Uh, we will certainly be having um, a couple of debriefs, one about the endorsement process. Uh, I think it's better than it used to be, but it still has some flaws in it. Still has some areas that we, some rough areas that need to be uh, ironed out. Better to do that now while it's still fresh in our mind and we don't have endorsements coming up. So we can do this with, with fresh eyes and without any sort of pressure to, to do it one way or another. And then um, we'll also be doing uh, a debrief on uh, the voter guide and, and you know what in the poll reading program and what went right, what went wrong, and what we should be uh, looking at to do on the, the next cycle. Uh, all right, Lois Richardson, you are on, you're able to speak. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and congratulations to everybody that, uh, that won on the recent ballot voting. Uh, but um, Chris, when will that discussion on the um, endorsements be? Uh, don't know yet, but it will be bef very likely before the end of this month, certainly by the end of the year. Okay. All right. I just want to stay in tune to that. To that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michelle Dietrich is, ask, is asking us to announce the date of the MDP general membership meeting, and I don't know when that is. So uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, I can... Uh, uh, I'm not sure when that is. So, Michelle, if you could share that. Uh, is there any other? Janet Cannon, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I hadn't really thought about it, but that whole question about the endorsement process, what form will that take? Would that be like a special meeting? Uh, yeah, it'll be a special meeting. What form it will take, I have no idea. I'm literally just crawling out from under a giant pile of. <laughs> Like all of us, going on and of course. Yeah. So, uh, but it, we, we'll, we'll have some conversation about that. And if you've got ideas, certainly uh, send them along, and you know, we'll, we'll definitely consider it. But it's important that we do it now. I think you know before the end of the year for sure. While it's still fresh in our minds, and you know we don't have the the pressures of endorsements staring at us, uh, and, and and you know, because things get political. We know how it goes, especially with endorsements. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other good and welfare? Any announcements people want to make? All right. The, the, the programs committee is going to discuss some of these um, after action meetings at, at its own programs committee meeting tomorrow morning. So if if this is of course not going to be the final word, Chris is going to be consulted. But if you have suggestions, if you could send it to me or Satish Ramadate um, this afternoon, perhaps because we are going to discuss this tomorrow, since um, we have to get rolling on this. But there will be several levels. There'll be sort of a general at the December meeting, and a, a bill, you know, the, the general membership can sort of give us their feedback, uh, and then we'll be doing some of these more specific, targeted ones um, on uh, the endorsement process and uh, the GOTV operation, precinct organizing operation in general, and on uh, the voter guides. So uh, and we'll, we'll we'll put notice out about those so people are aware of them. So, um, all right. Any other good and welfare? Michelle said she's looking up that date, but uh... okay. Uh, we'll hold on just for a second while she does that. Janet, go ahead. There it is. December 5th. December 5th. All right. Well, a we completely minor good and welfare question. I had a call from one of our precinct delegates asking if there was anything useful that he could do with all that huge collection of yard signs. <laughs> and I said, well, we've always talked about reusing the, um, the supports. 
but they're all different sizes and it's really very complicated. However, I would throw out that I would be willing to work with a small committee, a new subcommittee, if any is in, one is interested in doing a collection of them and eventually taking them uh, to scrap metal and then perhaps that would be a way for us to give one of those donations to a community organization. I love it. All right. So uh, I call Brian for, yeah, reach out to me. <laughs> yeah, Brian was asking yeah. me about that the other day. So you might talk to Brian Greminger about that. Okay. All right, great. All right, uh, Rayanne, go ahead. Make sure you unmute yourself. I just wanted to let you know that in 2018, a number of people brought uh, yard signs to the office and left them in at the back of the building or in the little alcove at the front. Oh, and we it was crazy. We collected them all up. I had 400 of those wires. I took them to the place on South State Street. They weighed them and we got $9.72 out of it. Oh, boy. <laughs> Drop us a 10 spot and keep the wires. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a labor of love, but I do think it's important. We're making a statement about recycling. Yep. And, uh, and what we have found out is that people do not want to reuse them. They would rather just pay the money to get new ones. Yep. Candidates. And we I mean, should probably put a them. sign up on the front door and the back door <laughs> asking people not to do that. <laughs> right. All Thank right. you. You bet. Uh, Kathleen Stroud. You're up. You have to unmute yourself, Kathleen. I move we adjourn. <laughs> okay, we have a motion to adjourn and we're going to finish our good welfare and then we'll come back if that's okay. Can we just, we just have a few more people. Uh, Rayanne is done. Uh, Carolyn Heichel, you are on. Oop, wait a minute. Let's talk. All right, I'm going to have to, all right, Carolyn, you are on. You're also on screen. Hi, uh, I just want to say, while it's top of mind, that I, I would be willing to figure out a way for my yard to be a gathering place for those of us. You cut out there. Could you just repeat that? There. Sure. I just, while it's top of mind, I just wanted to say I'm willing to have my yard be a gathering place for those metal what's it's. Okay. Okay. I, I, I could figure out a way to accommodate that without my neighbors having any fits. All right, so I'm going to task Carolyn and Janet to uh, talk together about that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jim Johnson, you are up. Uh, just a quick question. How do I get one of those signs? Which signs are you talking about? The Biden. Oh, uh, yeah. So we still have a bunch of them. <laughs> I've got some. Uh, where do you live? You, if you live on the west side, I've got them at, at my house in Dexter. And then I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, we have still still have some in the uh, in the office. I, I came by. I couldn't find any. So well, if you, uh, if you want to, uh, I'm going to put my phone number in the chat. OK. If you would like to. Uh, Okay, there it is. Um, I will, uh, you can send me a text or give me a phone call and I, I do have a bunch in my driveway. Wonderful, thank you. We were asking $10 donations since we purchased them, so. Yep. Um, yeah, for posterity, I, I bought a couple <laughs> myself. <laughs> uh, thanks. You betcha. All right. Uh, Loretta, you are up. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. You got Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So first, I want to say thank you to all you guys for all the wonderful work you did, your leadership and your friendship, and um, just all the efforts. It was amazing working with everybody. Um, and then, too, I don't know if you gathered, but I kept turning on and off my fan because I was trying to, you know, vote for the proposed, uh, for the bylaws. I don't know if I got to do that. Um, well, that was unanimous, so the, we'll, we'll put the, you uh, in the other vote. <laughs> Okay, that sounds good. Okay, good. I just yeah. want to make make note of that. And then the last thing is that, I don't know what uh, what the status, what we're planning to do, but there's supposed to be two runoff um, 
uh, two runoff races. Are we thinking about that at all? Because I would absolutely be willing to do whatever possible to help with that. With those, you're um, about the ones in, in Georgia, the Senate races in Georgia? Exactly, yeah. yeah have, there are conversations going on at the board level on that, so we'll, uh, we'll keep okay. people posted on how they can contribute for sure. And Loretta, thank you, by the way, for your, uh, your involvement with the Programs Committee and on the Precinct Organizing Committee. Uh, you were one of the, the volunteer leaders who really stepped it up, so really appreciate that from you. Or just going to be very, very hot between now and January 5th. <laughs> Oh any more money poured into those two races than any other race besides the president this year. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, right. We've got Irene next and Christina, if we're still in the... Irene, you are on. You'll need to unmute yourself. And by the way, congratulations on your victory. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. That's all I really wanted to come on and say and just congratulate the Washtenaw County Democratic Party for all of their efforts and the turnout and the sheets that were passed out on behalf of everyone, I think it made a huge difference in this race, both for us here at the local level as well as at the statewide level for the Supreme Court justices and everyone else. Thank you so much for your um, support of me. That's it. Thank you. Congratulations, Burger. Well to see you on the bench. Uh, Christina Watkins, you are up. Uh, sorry, my internet cut out and I must have missed the vote. So I just wanted to go on record that uh, I support the bylaw changes. That's okay. all. It was, uh, it was so a much. unanimous vote. There were, no zero, there were zero no votes. So you will add you to the gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to have my vote counted. You know, right. I was like so annoyed at Comcast. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> that kind of year, right? <laughs> Count every vote. Hashtag. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, I think with that, we are finished. We have a uh, motion on the table to adjourn. Second. Uh, we have a second. Um, oh, I, gotta have, I have to make a poll. Hang on a sec. Sorry. We're going to do this right. Uh, this will just take a second. I'm getting good at this. And poll. Uh, and you're uh, also a second. You're the third. All right, and now go back to this. All right, please vote <laughs> whether or not we can <laughs> This is the part about Zoom that drives me insane. <laughs> it looks like it's unanimous. <laughs> we are adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.